Hello again and welcome to everybody who has logged in for our webinar today on Big Data. Again, I'm your host, Karen Kurzweil with Relational Solutions. I welcome you to contact myself or Janet after the webinar today to request additional information on our company papers, our future webinars, software, and services. Before we get started, I'd like to give you a few instructions and do some housekeeping. We have muted all the participants, but it is also helpful to ask you to put your line on mute as well, since your headphones and other devices sometimes still can cause static. Second, we have activated the chat, so please feel free to ask questions. We will, however, wait until the end of the presentation to address those if time permits. Lastly, uh, we're utilizing a new WebEx contract, and we're going to be trying out some of the new features. We're hoping to have this presentation recorded and available for you on our YouTube channel um, in the next couple of days. Our presenter today is Janet Dorncott. She's an established data expert and an influencer in the CGT industry. Janet has over 20 years of experience in information technology. She started her career with her own desktop publishing business in the late 80s. She worked for a network protocol analyzing company in the early 90s and then moved on to Sybase, a database technology currently owned by SAP. In 1996, she founded Relational Solutions and co-owns the company with Rob York. Relational Solutions has been implementing data warehouses and business intelligence solutions since 1996. The complex issues associated with integrating point-of-sale and syndicated data led them to their focus on the consumer goods industry where they have developed applications including POS Smart and Blue Sky, designed for handling data complexities unique to CPG companies. Janet is a member of Retail Wire's Brain Trust and founder of the Demand Signal Repository Institute on LinkedIn. Relational Solutions has been recognized as leaders in the area of data integration and business intelligence. They've won numerous awards and have published success stories. They've conducted classes for large software companies as well as customers and have been involved in over 200 data warehouse and business intelligence projects, including implementations for Chrysler, Chase Manhattan Bank, Timken Industries, Xerox, and several others. With that, I'll turn this over to Janet. Um, to talk to you about big data. Janet, thank you for joining us today. Hi, Karen. Thank you. Um, I'd like to first thank, like to thank everyone who joined us today. We had so many registrants for the first webinar that we actually had to reschedule some of the attendees and have had um, added two more sessions. So I apologize to anyone who was rescheduled. But on that note, we're also very excited about the enthusiasm on this topic and hope you find this big data overview informational. Our goals for today are listed here. Uh, we want to define big data and the evolution of big data. We want to explain how implementing it correctly can really improve your business processes and increase employee productivity. We also want to discuss how you can use data across the enterprise, and lastly, talk about how big data, both internal and external, can be leveraged to improve business. So with that, I'm going to kick this off with a little company background so you, so you know who Relational Solutions is and what qualifies us as experts in this space, and then jump into the evolution of big data. This slide says big data is in our blood, and it is. As Karen mentioned, Relational Solutions was started back in 1996 as a data warehouse and business intelligence consulting company. Uh, no company really has the background that we have in big data. Myself and Rob came from a database company um, and started Relational Solutions because of the big data issues that existed back then. So back in the 90s, large companies were trying to implement data warehouse solutions, and back then there were a lot of data warehouse failures. This was due to several reasons. Um, companies, a lot of companies had no idea how to model for uh, data to easily be retrieved. Companies were used to modeling databases for data entry, and data retrieval really requires a different methodology. Second, companies often thought data warehousing was the same as data replication. So they simply copied the data and called it a data warehouse. They thought that by taking the burden off the transactional systems, they would be creating a nice reporting environment for their users. And although it did take the burden off the transactional systems, it didn't quite help the end users access data, data any easier. So surprisingly, we still see some of those quote unquote data warehouse systems in place today. Also, companies often confused backup recovery and fault tolerance with data warehouses. 
they simply thought a data warehouse was supposed to be protection against anything that might take it might make their systems go down. And they didn't see data warehousing as a strategic advantage. They saw it simply as a backup recovery system. Again, we're often surprised to see companies that still have that type of data warehouse, quote unquote data warehouse in place, but um, but they actually, we would not call that a true data warehouse. Another reason they failed back then was a lack of business sponsorship. So with CIT departments that would often uh, be sponsors of the data warehouse and they heard people maybe ask for certain reports and felt that they could build, build what the users wanted. But even in those rare cases when they designated or actually designed it correctly, if they didn't have a business sponsor who had a uh, quantifiable need, the project often failed. And that's because the whole philosophy of build it and they will come um, was not really a philosophy for success. So it's easy to find business users, but prioritizing those needs and finding the business sponsor who has both the need and the drive to get it done are two very different things. Relational Solutions has been solving these big data issues for years. Um, we were the first company in the country to actually use some of the second generation code or, or tools that were used to extract and integrate data versus handwriting code. So tools like Informatica and DataStage back in the mid 90s were brand new. And we saw value in those tools because we were seeking a better way to manage changes for our customers. Um, with tools that graphically display integration comes the ability to document processes and more easily manage changes. So the whole nature of data warehousing is that it's constantly changing and growing to accommodate new business needs as well as changes in your environment, such as new applications, mergers, new data sources, and so forth. And by implementing a foundational architecture that accommodates changes, companies are able to accommodate new data, including big data. Um, as Karen mentioned, we implemented some of the country's largest scale data warehouses. I think she mentioned Chase Manhattan Bank and Chrysler and Xerox, but we were also involved in implementations at Bell South, Sherwin-Williams, Synergy, uh, the American Bar Association, Dana, Dow Agro, Rigid Tools, ODOT, which is the Ohio Department of Transportation, um, over 200 implementations, and we really became the go-to company if you needed help with integration issues. Large database vendors and big consulting companies came to us for help, and they still do today. Even the data integration vendors like Informatica and DataStage uh, some, uh, subcontracted our, our resources. So we started focusing on the consumer goods space back in 2000, and the reason for that was the more consumer goods companies we went into, the more we discovered the same issue, and that being dealing with all sorts of external data. So over time, point of sale data become, became more readily available. Um, we actually went out and we bought and customized our own data integration engine and enhanced that to design it um, so that it would support both internal as well as external data. And we enhanced that to uh, include things like EDI data and so forth. But our expertise in this space has really led to solid partnerships with database vendors like Teradata, SAP, and IBM. Our, our product manager was actually on the cover of Oracle's magazine as a, their developer of the year one year. Today we still have, um, we actually have a full end-to-end -end solution that includes data integration and business intelligence. That's called POS Martin Blue Sky. And we're not really going to go into any product information today. If you're interested in seeing that, you can always sign up for one of our demos online. This is designed to be a very informational webinar on big data. But, um, but we do think our partnerships are a testament to our expertise in this space. IBM actually partners with, uh, with us on their Smarter Commerce solution, and they embed our, our um, processes in there. Infosys embeds our application in their application designed to integrate emerging market data. Uh, we directly support SAP, and we are working on some co-development with them to do the cleansing and validation for um, point-of-sale data that will feed their HANA application. We've won IT awards um, from organizations like, like um, BI Network, and we've also won awards from industry growth associations like Inc. 500 and Weatherhead 100. Uh, most recently, we were nominated for NEOSA's Best Software Award. So this is our company background, and I'm really very proud of our company and our team. But mostly I'm telling you this to give credibility to the fact that we have years of history in dealing with data. And today we are leading the way in leveraging and teaching companies about big data. And with that, I have a couple slides designed to level set and explain big, uh, big data from the beginning. 
Um, I'll get into Hadoop and MapReduce, but given the diverse audience, it's important for us to level set on business intelligence with a couple of slides to kind of kick us off. So, again, we have a wide range of participants on the call. So some are from consumer goods companies, some are from other industries, and a lot are even from consulting companies, from large software companies. Uh, because of the wide range of titles we have I, and the different experience levels, I decided to add a few slides here to level set and give a little background history on business intelligence. So business intelligence, what is it and, and why do we need it? Um, first of all, business intelligence is the ability to make fact-based decisions based on reliable and integrated data. And business intelligence leverages data to provide you with reports and information and allows users to make those fact-based decisions. In a perfect world, business intelligence data is derived from an enterprise data warehouse and designed correctly. We actually call that a truth database. But business intelligence can also arguably be derived from other stovepipe solutions. These are point solutions that are typically developed within a department to answer specific questions. It can be argued that ERP reports provide business intelligence. So business intelligence can also be derived from reports that end users have to manually integrate in order to deliver reports for their management or for their buyers. So different types of reports are delivered through different means. As purists, we believe business intelligence should be derived from a data warehouse. But again, that doesn't mean all reports are the same. And we also recognize that even business intelligence reports designed for managing the business are derived in different ways. So why do we need business intelligence? Well, back in the 90s, business intelligence was actually considered a luxury, and that's because building a data warehouse was very expensive, and BI tools, business intelligence tools, were very expensive. Today, business intelligence is not a luxury. It is an absolute necessity, and your competitors are understanding more and more about their business, and therefore, you have to also, um, just to maintain your competitive advantage, you have to understand your business as well. But companies in the 90s did it to gain a competitive advantage. Today it's needed just to maintain that competitive advantage. So those companies who were visionaries in the 90s and recognized it as a way to achieve a competitive advantage are the same companies today who are leveraging big data from other sources to, again, gain a competitive edge. So it's important to note that operational reports are not the same as analytical reports in this definition. And I'll describe what I mean by that in the next slide. But a true business intelligence application is designed to support management decisions. And it includes reports that are derived from a single queryable source of reliable integrated data fed in a single state or fed by a single staging area. So it should have applicable applicable business rules that are established for your business users and your company. And again, in an ideal world, business intelligence is derived from a data warehouse that's designed based on the union of all marts. And I'll get into a little bit more of a description on that. But first I want to describe the fact that there are transactional reports and there are analytical reports. And because companies and individuals get confused on them, I, again, just want to insert this slide to level set everyone. Um, the easiest way to understand the difference is to think of a transactional system as those applications that are designed to run your business. So applications like SAP, Oracle Financials, JD Edwards, JDA, for example, these are all transactional applications. And these are systems that are designed and modeled for data entry. They're updated constantly throughout the day. And reports derived from these systems are generally reports designed to understand what's going on at this moment. So, um, for example, a, 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 shipping, a shipping manager might want to know, what time did my last truck leave? What was on that last truck? Is my manufacturing formula set correctly today? Um, and what did what did my last customer complain about? That might be something a someone from a, um, a customer complaint department may want to know. These are operational type reports, and your day to day operations depend on them. So a report pulled from a transaction system at noon will produce different results than a report pulled at say 12:01, and that's because the operational system is constantly changing. So even reports pulled simultaneously from an operational system, from a transaction system, will likely produce different results because it can take a different path depending on the data model. So not to get too technical, but um, any, any time that you're querying an operational system and there are people that are updating that system at the same time, the report results will be different. And it's because 
that database is changing, and we actually call that the twinkling database effect. And again, that's because the data is always changing. So these twinkling databases are fine for pulling operational reports, but trying to produce an analytical report from an operation or transactional system is not always wise. So first, the data is formatted for entry, not retrieval. Therefore, it could take days to query the system, depending on what you're trying to query. In addition, this will affect the performance of the operational system, as well as the end user trying to enter orders and conduct other job functions. So analytical queries will put an undue burden on your network if you're trying to uh, produce a report out of a transactional system. In addition, it will return inconsistencies and oftentimes inaccurate results. And that's why data warehouse solutions became popular. Um, they're designed to provide business intelligence that will help companies manage their business. So a clear distinction between the types of reports. Data warehousing reports, analytical reports designed to manage your business, transactional reports designed to run your business. The, the, the database is modeled in a way that business users can easily find and retrieve data that they need. Query tools allow for easy analysis and fast capability to allow users to drag and drop and drill and sort and compare and learn more about your business. And more and more, we're hearing business analysts being referred to as data scientists. And that's because rather than just gathering and reporting information, data can be put into usable formats for true data exploration. So data scientists are, are really um, focused on finding out new information about your business. However, the data warehouse is fed by the operational system and typically updated on a nightly basis, sometimes more often, but it's often nightly. Um, and again, I'm pointing out these differences because this all provides a very good foundation which will lead into big data. And big data creates a potentially fuzzy area for reporting depending on how it's defined. So one of my customers recently told me if you ask 50 people what big data is, you'll get 50 answers. Our goal today is to help clarify some of those answers. Big data crosses both areas, but in analyzing big data, companies are attempting to learn more about their customer, their buying patterns, their behaviors, and how to best market to them. I also recently heard an expert in supply chain analytics refer to big data as anything over a petabyte of data. I would actually disagree with this because I think that's an arbitrary number. Um, it's just a number that focuses strictly on volume, and big data is really about much more than just volume, and we'll discuss that shortly. But um, very simply, this picture depicts the data warehouse as the union of all marts. A data mart, you will hear that terminology. It can be a standalone. Uh, there are stovepipe marts. However, when a data mart is integrated appropriately with the other data marts, it becomes the union of all marts, which can become the data warehouse. So a mart can be a standalone, but in the form of a stovepipe, of a stovepipe it's considered a, a silo of information. And again, today I hear some experts in the industry use the term silos as if it's something new. It's, it's not a new term at all. These are terms that in the data warehousing world we've used since in the, the 80s and 90s. They're used to describe standalone reporting solutions. And typically these standalone solutions were developed by individual teams or individuals or departments. And they're typically developed because they had to develop something to achieve a specific goal um, that they probably weren't able to get budget approval for, maybe for IT to develop. They, they resort to basically building something on their own because they need it and they have to, they have, to have something. So these silos kind of pop up um, from time to time and they'll continue to pop up because you know, budgets are always restricted in some way, shape, or form. But when these silos um, actually become data marks that can be, become integrated with the data warehouse, then we're actually building upon that infrastructure. So designed correctly, a data mark can be integrated and should be fed from a single staging area where business rules can be applied. And in the data warehousing world, we set up an infrastructure that stages the data, cross-references the data, cleanses it, harmonizes it, and feeds it into subject-specific marks that have shared dimensions. And I could easily spend an hour just describing that process. I could spend a day describing that process, but that's a separate webinar. So um, in short, designed correctly, it allows business rules to be applied and data to be easily accessed. This design also maintains consistency from department to department. It also provides IT with a manageable solution that is designed to evolve over time and accommodate new data sources and new user requirements. Companies who have a properly designed data warehouse can integrate internal data, out, external data, and even big data. So big data 
Big Data actually really started with, um, in our opinion, with ERP systems and data warehousing. Um, I'll get into more on that. But you can make the claim that it started back in, 19, in the 1950s with IBM's Big Iron and Big Data Processing to handle mixed workloads. I think it was Oracle who first coined the acronym VLDB back in the 90s. And VLDB stands for Very Large Databases. So I don't know about you, but I, I think, uh, I don't know which sounds bigger, very large or big. But back in 1992, it was Teradata who first built a system over a terabyte, and that was for Walmart. This was the biggest implementation for its time, and Teradata called their platform Massively Parallel Processing, or MPP. And I definitely think massive sounds a lot bigger than big, but today it's all big data. For the record, NIFI is another uh, MPP platform. But regardless, the database companies have been in the big data business for years. But big data today is not the same as big data from 10 years ago. Today there's been a full-blown explosion of data, and I'll describe um, that data evolution here in my slide. It says the big data explosion. So as I mentioned earlier, the big data explosion started with data from applications designed to run your business. ERP, or Enterprise Resource Planning Applications, really took off in the 80s and 90s. And companies like SAP and Oracle and Microsoft, um, SAS, JDA, JDE, all of these companies offer ERP solutions. In for, um, these are applications designed to run your business. And again, they have manufacturing applications, logistics solutions, invoicing um, applications. They have systems that let users place orders, answer customer calls, and so on. Um, by the way, they also have reports associated with each of these applications. So in the early 90s, companies started getting serious about using the, that data from those ERP systems to improve knowledge. Business processes and, and profits were also um, a goal for using and integrating uh, that data. So data warehousing was really in its infancy. There were a lot of failures when companies would spend lots of money to build the data warehouse, and they still have inconsistent reports and trouble creating reports. That's actually the reason we're in business. Uh, while most consulting companies back then were focused on Y2K compliance, we focused specifically on data warehousing, arch the architectures and foundations of data warehousing and business intelligence. And we're really the first company in the country to partner with those second generation tools um, to streamline the process. We actually have our own called Blue Sky Integration Studio as well. Um, and we customize that for consumer goods companies. But these are all tools that helped us manage the big data associated with data warehousing and business intelligence. Um, interestingly, companies who use those tools and that we implemented those tools for back in the 90s are still using them today, which is a really good testament for their longevity and to the value of using an integration engine versus code to integrate and cleanse and manage data. But next we saw the beginnings of cooperation between partners. And we really felt like missionaries back in the 90s in the consumer goods space in the late 90s and early 2000s when we were trying to explain the value of sharing data, uh, especially to the retailers sharing their point of sale data. They thought we were crazy asking them to share that data with their vendors. But today, they, most of them seem to get it. Today, they really understand that value, some more than others, but it's finally, finally caught on. So as more and more outside partners um, and new vendors began offering data and insights, we were able to leverage that data and develop a solution to integrate those data sources within the company's existing data warehouse and architecture. And that's where our uh, POS Smart infrastructure came in, and we've been integrating those outside sources since the 90s. So some of those sources include uh, point of sale data, EDI files, syndicated data from companies like IRI, Nielsen, Retail Solutions, NPD, panel data, demographic data, currency conversion. These are just, a, you know, there's, there's a slew of outside data sources available. Um, this gives a pretty good idea, but even some of those sources I've listed here are not yet shared freely. And loyalty data is one example. Uh, today, there's also a huge demand to integrate emerging market data or a lot of discussion about that. And although a lot of companies are talking about it, we're only familiar with one that's, that's truly doing it. Um, another source that companies are starting to want to share information with are their wholesalers and distributors and their brokers and their selling partners. And in the consumer goods space, people are starting to understand that value. It's interesting to see how the markets evolve. People and companies that we preached this to years ago are coming back and saying, 
oh, you didn't do this a few years ago. But our answer is that, yeah, actually this is exactly what we've been preaching for all these years. It's exactly what we've always done. Um, unfortunately, a lot of companies didn't understand what we were doing unless they were from IT. And actually, in, mo in most cases, it was the business users who may have had the budget and not IT. And really, they were focused more on reports and the point solution, whether it was coming from a point solution or a silo or from a, a portal of some sort, they cared about the reports. And understanding that they need to walk before we run, that's very understandable. But as the, the market evolves, we're starting to see even business users today understand that infrastructure does matter. Um, that's changing. And as the market continues to evolve and companies are, and the people in those companies are maturing in their understanding of how important it is to have a big data infrastructure, um, we're starting to see uh, people really understand that value. And even companies who once maybe considered us competitors are understanding that we do things differently. It's a foundation. Those data sources don't need to go away. There's a foundation that needs to exist to integrate those, and that's what we do. So now we also see big data. That's the latest in this evolution. So combined to us, it's all big data. But in the pure sense of how software companies are referring to big data today, they're mainly talking about data coming in from the web, and that includes social media chatter that comes from Facebook and Google Plus and Twitter. It also includes comments and announcements and posts from professional networking sites like LinkedIn. These are common areas that people think of when it comes to big data. But there are also many other areas listed here. Think about um, speech to text, translating everything that's said into a recorder, into a searchable text, for example, is big data. Video content and its associated metadata um, posted on sites like YouTube, for example, that's all big data. If you think about all the photos that are posted on Instagram and Facebook, um, even profile pictures on LinkedIn, that's all become big data. And now add to, add to it things like geospatial information, so location information. This is information that can be used by companies to do things like track shipments. Um, other companies that may be out there identifying missing cars or monitoring storms and so forth. This all relies on geographic or um, geospatial data. And then how about blogs? Um, comments on blogs are tracked by companies to determine what's being said about them. Um, my company actually uses Google Alerts and Tracker, uh, Google Tracker to find out when our competitors are making announcements about new products or identifying comments that might be being said about POS Smart or Blue Sky. So this is all big data. Uh, my husband is actually an engineer and they scan and share schematics and blueprints over the web. The big one kind of people think about on the web is, is clickstream analysis. We actually implemented a clickstream analysis application back in the 90s for a telecom company who wanted to track where their customers were going on their website. Today, clickstream analysis is used to target market customers based on what they seem to like, what, they, what they're clicking on, but it can also be based on what they buy and their demographics when integrated with other big data. So why is big data associated with these items in the last circle and what is the difference in the data? Why do I have the circles around these different data types here? And what determines where each of these items reside? Well, it's really related to structure. So um, what's the difference in the, in the data sources? And the first cylinder here represents the first two circles that I had on the last page. And that's because they're structured data. So however they're structured, they're structured differently, which, which is why I had them in separate circles on the previous slide. So if I skip back here a second, you see that these two circles, they're structured data. But again, they're structured differently. We've got the transaction system. We've got the analytical system. So in this first cylinder, um, I have them together because they're structured. And that said, again, they're still structured. ERP applications are structured in a way that allow for data entry, and they're designed to run your business. The data warehouse is also structured, but it's structured in a way for information retrieval that will help you manage your business. The data that's on the web is mostly unstructured. Social media information includes things like tweets and comments, but it also includes your activity. It can track your clicks, your followers, your likes. It can track your social authority or clout by determining how many followers you have and how many people are following you. Depending on the number of people you have and the capacity that you have to influence them is one way of determining your social authority or clout. Um, someone, for example, with 100 followers does not have the same clout as someone with 3,000 followers, for example. 
So we've heard big data in the news a lot lately. Um, on June 6th, the Wall Street Journal published an article that the NSA, America's National Security, Security Agency, is obtaining complete records of all Verizon customers in their calling history, including all local and long distance calls within the U.S. Um, this made the news because it made a lot of people upset. The government claims it tracks and uses this information to help identify terrorists, and we hope that's true because that's what they're telling us. But monitoring big data has also come up in stories associated with the monitoring of, of certain journalist calls and activity and also related to IRS targeting of applications for certain nonprofits. Monitoring of these activities requires them to leverage big data. And again, it's supposed to be done for our nation's protection in this case, so we have to have faith in them. But have no doubt, the capacity to leverage big data for good, for bad, for profit, for target marketing, for whatever, it's there. And the technology exists today that allows us to track and monitor and profile whatever and whomever we want. Um, the way companies use that unstructured data, typically, that we see is for target marketing and for reputation management. And I'll give some examples of those in a few slides. And this last cylinder here represents multi-structured data or hybrid data. And a lot of sources can fall into this space. This is the space that we've historically kind of focused on because we kind of nailed that structured part years ago. Um, and now we're focusing on this unstructured space. So for the purpose of consumer goods manufacturers, I use common outside data sources. For example, point of sale data might come in from Target in an EDI file, but it might also come from Partners Online or Info Retriever. Um, EDI data is structured. However, although it's supposed to be standardized, it's not. So different retailers provide different data. Data can be missing or invalid or duplicated. Data also needs to be aligned with other third-party data that might come in from, from other you know, websites like Nielsen or IRI. and also needs to align with your internal hierarchies and calendars. And these are just a few examples of data issues that arise from outside data sources. In other words, there's some structure to it, but the structure needs to be altered in order to be managed, integrated into other sources, and ultimately to provide more value. So what does big data consist of? First of all, volume. Data volumes today are incredible. We talked about many of the different types of sources out there. If you think about a company with 2,000 SKUs that are selling through 100 different retailers in tens of thousands of stores, um, imagine that each store is sending that CPG company sales information, including what's sold, how many items were sold, the time, the date, the sale, the price, potentially loyalty data, market basket information, um, on-hand inventory. All of these things are huge data that would tell them who the customer is, what they bought, what they're buying. We're talking massive, massive data volumes on top of the ERP data that's already coming in from your internal sources. And let's consider sources now that are also outside sources, sort of outside sources, but sources that are coming from Facebook and your link your LinkedIn page, your Twitter feeds about your company or your brands, your YouTube commercials, and so on. You're talking huge data volume. And I don't limit volume. I'll go back to this in just a second here. Um, I don't limit volume based on a petabyte. I recently heard another presentation, and I, I actually kind of chuckled because this came from a business person who, who really has no um, – IT knowledge, no background in data warehousing or databases or really anything related to IT infrastructure. And they gave big data a number, and it was anything over a petabyte. But just because that's a big number doesn't mean a terabyte isn't necessarily big data to another company. The volume to one company or to one individual can cause an issue, even if that data volume is the same as another company who's not having an issue with that data. Every company is different, every environment is different, so even smaller amounts of data can cause issues for one company and not another. So to actually apply a number to big data, to me, is irrelevant. Volume is, um, volume is the word we use because to a small company, volume might be one number, and that might constitute big data. To a big company, it's going to be a completely different number, and that might constitute big data. But that said, it's about volume, but it's more than that. It's also about variety. So CPG companies are no stranger to variety. In addition to their own internal variety of data residing in Access and Excel and Oracle and in their old mainframes and SAP and DB2 and so forth, we have the, um, the end user applications like trade promotion management applications, your planogram data, CRM applications, 
forecasting, just a, a whole slew of applications out there. In addition, the variety that it's coming in from the retailers includes EDI files, AS2, retail portal down, retailer portal downloads, syndicated data. Uh, most companies are also buying information like demographics, survey information, they might be buying weather trend information, or they may be downloading um, today's currency conversion information. They might even be tracking emerging market data. Um, this is all stuff that has existed over, over the past few years, and now you have new data coming in that's tracking your social reputation and your media presence. In addition, you might have space information, displays, diagrams, they're all unstructured. So marketing teams have ads, including print and online ads, TV commercials, radio spots. They might also have online targeting, um, online targeted marketing on social media that include offers on websites or mobile offers. And these sources are in different data formats containing different information. This all adds up to a lot of different variety. And data just got bigger with more variety. But we also have to consider um, timing. So it's not just volume and variety, it's velocity. ERP data is updated every second of the day by multiple users across the company. POS data can come in daily, weekly, or monthly. Pricing information and zip code information might come in quarterly or annually. Uh, Clickstream is happening constantly. Twitter feeds and hashtags happen sporadically throughout the day. So for smaller companies, it might only happen a couple times a month. However, frequently social media comments happen, they still need to be monitored constantly. So for larger companies who have regular comments about their products, responses to negative sentiment hopefully happen immediately. At, at the very least, your social listening group should be checking your Facebook page at least every hour, and if not, that needs to change. Because negative comments on your Facebook page shouldn't be there long enough to other, for other people to be on there liking them. I was actually just at a customer who had implemented a social listening team about a month ago. During that meeting, I logged onto their Facebook page and pointed out to them that they had a very negative comment right at the top of their Facebook page that had been there for over two hours. In those two hours, that comment had received over 100 likes and about 10 other negative comments that were posted along with that first one. And amazingly, that comment stayed throughout our three-hour meeting, in which I couldn't believe that no one in the room logged in to fix the problem right away, even when I made them aware of it and told them they should, they should go in and delete that. But anyway, um, had this comment been caught earlier, they could have deleted the comment and even blocked the follower. And I actually believe that follower should have been blocked because I think that that post was made by one of their competitors. The reason I thought it was one of their competitors is because it was a very generic negative comment. So it was completely unrelated to a bad experience or even a recent event. So most genuine negative comments are related to a bad experience or a recent event. Social media has made it very easy to influence a company's reputation. So managing that social reputation is more important today than ever before. But to manage it, you must be aware of it and you must have the re ability to respond. And we recommend tools that will help manage this for you. Once you begin managing it, you can start analyzing it. But first and foremost, you need to know when something negative is going on, and you need to respond to it quickly. Um, we do plan to make our big data webinar a series with some quarterly updates, hopefully. In next quarter's update, we hope to include some information on software applications that can help, you, help make you aware of negative comments quickly. Um, we're aware of several of them. We're kind of in evaluating process with some of them and have partnered with a couple of them. So, um, you know, we're hoping to make this a series and continue to provide value, valuable information for you. Um, so most companies define big data as volume, variety, and velocity. I actually add one more key component to that big data, and that's complexity. Um, to me, volume, variety, and velocity, along with complexity, makes up big data. And you might think variety covers complexity, but it, it really doesn't. Making social media data work with other business areas to provide value involves a lot of complexity. And when that data needs to be put into a usable format, there are all sorts of alignments and rules that need to be applied. And these rules code, processes, these are all need to be written to extract data, load it, cleanse it, refine it. All that variety of data needs to be transformed into a common data type for analysis. So there's also metadata, which is data about the data. And again, I'm hearing business users talk about metadata now, but metadata has been around for years and years and years. 
and that needs to be managed. So just the process alone of trying to align data and put it into a usable format becomes new data. So volume, variety, and velocity focus strictly on the source. But data that makes that data usable with internal data for your internal teams um, is also new data. So that new data needs to be structured, documented, maintained, and managed. And complexity adds to big data. So these are just a few examples of where CPG companies add to big data due to complexity, but aligning hierarchies, integrating master data with retailer master data, comparing sales with sentiment, as well as promotions and pricing. So if you want to see what your people are saying on your website and then comparing that with actual sales from that location, comparing it with promotions and with pricing, these are just a few examples, again, of the complexity involved in getting more value out of that big data. Today we can see sentiment, but how valuable is that sentiment if we can't make it associated with anything internal? Um, now, we can't really talk about big data without talking about Hadoop and MapReduce. So first, what is Hadoop? I'm going to kind of go through these just because everybody hears these words and this terminology. Um, back in 2004, Google wrote a white paper about MapReduce. It was developed to handle huge data volumes that were being used on the Internet. They needed it for themselves. So, and, and they needed it for the purpose of all of these people coming in and doing searches on the internet and then the social sites then popping up. Um, Hadoop is an Apache project. It is an open source data library. It mainly consists of two components. And I'm not going to get too deep into the weeds on this, on the technical aspect, but again, I'm trying to give a high level understanding of what um, Hadoop and MapReduce are. But it's an open source data library with two components. First, it's a large-scale distributed file system called HDFS, which spreads processes across hardware. And second, MapReduce, which reduces and distills data volume. Um, MapReduce provides parallelization of the data and reduces that data into results. This slides from Google's presentation back in 2004 on MapReduce. And, of course, the big claim is that MapReduce allows programmers without any experience with parallel and distributed systems to easily utilize the resources of a large distributed system. On this slide, I've depicted MapReduce in a way, or I should say on the next slide, I've depicted MapReduce in a way that's easy to understand what's going on in each step. And, again, this is about as technical as I'll get. But this slide is a simple um, display of how MapReduce works. It's really a simple word count. On the left here, um, this image, this is your data input. It's simply text with no structure. Um, you've got boat, yacht, lake, house, yacht, lake, boat, house, yacht, fish, fish, fish. Um, MapReduce first splits the data, as you can see in the second phase of this diagram. So it takes those different data inputs and it splits it, as you can see here. Next, it shuffles that data into, it maps that data and counts it, and then it shuffles it into like bins. So from here you see boat one, from here you see boat one, and those are now shuffled into like bins. Same with yacht, yacht one and yacht one, shuffled into like bins. It then reduces the data based on counts. So you see boat two, it reduces that. And finally, it produces a summary result. And that's really what MapReduce is doing. Um, my next slide shows some common terminology. These are common term terms that you'll hear when the topics big data and Hadoop and MapReduce are discussed. Um, these are you know, common terms. I'm not going to describe each of these, but the top three you're going to hear kind of often, I guess, if you're, especially if you're on IT. I probably should have included HDFS on this as well, although I think I defined that earlier. If I didn't, it stands for Hadoop Distributed File System, HDFS. And it would be a good idea just to familiarize yourself with some of this terminology. Again, I mostly included this slide just so you can refer to it for your information. So how can big data be used? Well, if you have a database like Hadoop or Astro or Cloudera, um, you can use big data to ask questions related to activity on the web. 
Big data solutions are designed to identify what's going on on the web and then respond to it. So you can alter customer sentiment, target market to specific users, uh, make, make, make those recommendations based on their activity. Different companies have a different need based on how they sell their product. And although most CPG companies have web activity and web sales, the bulk of sales for a CPG company are, tend to be lower priced items that people still buy at a store with a lot of other lower priced items. So they have a need to leverage social media both on the web and with their current business intelligence systems. But still, we have all this data on the web. We also have data coming in from our e-commerce site and other places. We have click streams that we want to analyze and track. But why do we want to do that? How can we use this data? The first bullet describes some examples of how big data can be leveraged. Companies can integrate sentiment with sales as one more input that may affect sales. So recognizing that other things, obviously promotions and pricing affect sales, um, some things that there are also some things that might be out of your control, um, maybe a hurricane or other natural disaster. Some might be something that you wouldn't even realize is going on unless your customers are chatting about it. Um, things like a picket line that kept, that kept them from entering a store. Um, again, that could be an example of something you discover on social media that might help you understand why you're, what your customers are feeling and what they're experiencing and why sales may be down in that particular location. So just to broaden your understanding of how different big data is used, I'll give a couple examples outside of the consumer goods industry as well. I heard a really good one recently. In the healthcare industry today, doctors often document their patients, um, their, their meetings by recording what happened and what was discussed and recommendations. These recordings in the past were documented using a dictaphone, and today they use voice-to-text recognition. So they may also be kept in audio form. Hospitals really don't have the hardware to keep all of this data since audio recordings are such huge files and they have tons of doctors. And in most cases, audio files are deleted about every two weeks from, from what this um, report said. So it makes it impossible to retrieve them at a later date. However, with MapReduce, they can store these recordings for future use and use them to determine diagnosis and treatment effectiveness or even to defend the hospital or a doctor in a malpractice case, for example. Um, that's one that a health, a good example in a healthcare industry. Another example is one of an online social media site. Um, they use their own internal social media information to help recommend promotions to their users. They can recommend diet pills to women over 40. They can present coupons for, for pizza or back to school specials to mom with kids. They can find, they can identify and find you new friends or recommend new connections um, who you might actually know. And that's the way the social media sites use big data. We're currently actually working with a customer today to align social media sentiment with sales to help determine if their responses to negative sentiment were successful and if the sentiment remained positive. They recognize there are other factors such as promotions and pricing, but the plan is to eventually integrate those sources as well to give them a more complete view of their sales, what's going on in certain geographies, and how it's affecting their sales and their profits. So using big data as part of your social strategy requires you to be constantly listening. Um, again, monitoring tools help make that happen, but you may also you know, have to be, or not you may also, you do also have to be engaged. Engagement means both at a personal level with people responding and on an automated basis where you can schedule messages and streamline some of your activity. The personal interaction requires you to have people who are constantly responding to sentiment that's posted on your site and about your products. And these people have a need to know, these people who are making those postings have a need to know that you are listening and need to know that you're responding. Um, they need to be heard, they want to be heard, and you need to turn any negative sentiment into positive or neutral sentiment before too many people are influenced. You also need to know who your champions are. Who are these people saying great things about your product? Because you should be rewarding them for being such good customers. You need to keep your followers informed and also customize offers for them as well. And the only way to, to do this is to actually track and to manage your social media. Um, leveraging big data means you have to be able to access that and certain queries related to activities occurring on the web can be accessed right from the technologies using MapReduce. Other queries require you to align that information with internal data currently residing in your data, in your data warehouse. So once that complexity is dealt with, 
The key is to analyze the information and act on it, just as, it's, just as it is with any business intelligence solution. And that's really where we're coming from when we talk about um, complexity, because integrating that social media data and turning it into something that makes sense when you align it with internal data is very, very complex. But it can be done, provided you have the right foundation in place. And it can be done if you need to, you know, alter and create a new and more flexible foundation as well. So that complexity is very important. So these are some pretty critical statistics. I found them recently. Um, these are the most recent ones I could find. But the sources include Twitter, Pew Research, McKinsey, and Google. And as of last year, Twitter had over 100 million active users. That's projected to reach 200 million this year. So we're halfway through the year, it's probably already to 150 because I think I didn't have any more recent stats. 50 million Twitter users log on every day, and over half are mobile users. And that's growing constantly. Today there are over 300 million tweets per second, and again, growing exponentially. The record number of tweets on a single topic were related to Steve Jobs, where 2.5 million tweets happened in the first 13 hours after his death just specifically on that topic. That's pretty amazing. But people spend 700 trillion minutes on Facebook each month. 700 trillion minutes. That's not even fathomable. Google records 34,000 searches per second. The data explosion is really still in its infancy. With the evolution of smartphones and mobile data, it is truly exploding, and this is why people are calling this big data. Again, social media and using web apps are still really in their infancy. It's changing the way we do business. It's changing the way we get information and interact with family and friends and so on. New sites and applications are popping up all the time to address another need that we want or that we need. Um, these are just several of you know, the everyday sites that we're seeing being used regularly today. And today these are common names, but 10 years ago we never heard of them. And most, in fact, most of these didn't even exist 10 years ago. I think the next wave of apps that are going to be related to, mobile, that are going to, be related to big data will be um, mobile payments and store tracking, geo-tracking for CPG companies anyways. And you know, that they're going to be able to allow you. I, I saw several examples of this in the, um, at a ramp conference that I was recently at, but where you'll be able to make offers to your customers based on where they're standing in the store. And they'll also be able to pay for products as they're walking through the store. They'll be able to scan them their, themselves. So that eventually they'll be able to pay for products without even going through the register, just, you know, to validate. After that, there'll be another wave of development, and who knows what the next wave of apps will be after that. But I really believe that the next wave is going to be related to mobile payments and um, geo, geo um, spatial tracking. But the key here is that it's really only just begun. So here's an example of a basic report that's simply showing counts. Um, how many interactions did you have? How many comments and likes did you have? This is a very, very basic report. It was available back in 2009, and I'm showing this to you because this is four years later. Back in 2009, there were applications that helped to track this. But that's pretty obsolete today. Today, we have more information that can be gleaned and more information that can be exported and integrated with internal data. This report shows me positive and negative sentiment by gender, for example. So I realize that this is small because it's just a screenshot of, um, of the actual, oops, I'm sorry, a screenshot of the, um, the report in our application, but it's showing sentiment. I've got negative, neutral, and positive sentiment. So we used um, uh, an application to apply sentiment to certain words we exported that data. We exported the um, followers, the people they were following, and the Twitter, um, you know, their total followers. And this is showing me my female compared to my male followers and um, their social uh, influence and the number of negative and positive comments coming. Now, this is showing it as they pertain to state. Up here, I have all sorts of different fields, but I can pull any of this into or out of the reports. Across here, I've got a sort. Um, and I've got my state, and I'm showing 
on Twitter my negative, neutral, and positive comments and my total comments. And I'm tracking that by state. And I can see here that uh, uh, Louisiana has a bunch of um, really, let's see, what am I looking at? I'm looking at negative tweets. So something's going on in that state. And this is just an example of how we can look at it by geography. This example is showing me where my champions are. So I'm looking at my positive tweets by geography. So somewhere here in, in uh, Massachusetts, there's a lot of positive sentiment. And same with here in Indiana. So, you know, again, kind of extracting that data and understanding it is one thing. Taking this data then to the next level where we're comparing it with actual sales gives us an even broader view of um, information. Again, here we're just showing where negative sentiment's existing and where we need damage control. And using that damage control, we really need to um, understand, you know, if we align this with our sales, how can we correlate this showing sentiment and how it's affecting sales? And that might prompt management to investigate the issues more deeply. So this one here is also showing what the actual comments are, and it allows users to drag and drop information into the report to gain even more intelligence. These are just a few examples of reports we've created to show our customers how they can leverage big data. As I said in an earlier slide, companies need to walk before they run. So if you want to leverage social media data with your existing data, you first need to make sure you have a sound internal architecture that will allow you to integrate other data sources like your sales information. Um, social media data is just one input that will help you increase sales and improve brand loyalty, get the foundation in place that is most critical. So our goals for today were hopefully um, accomplished. We were trying to define big data, explain how it can be used, and um, the importance of leveraging social media data. I believe we accomplished that, and hopefully you believe so too. Um, I want to thank everybody um, for participating. The webinar will be repeated several times over the next few months. Feel free to share the information on how to participate with your peers. We'll also offer webinars on putting the correct foundation in place to help you leverage big data. In an as uh, in addition, as big data continues to evolve, we plan to do those quarterly updates, providing new ideas and topics um, and so forth. So I, again, I, I recently asked a database vendor if they have an application to track and analyze sentiment, and that vendor said, yeah, it's such and such, and they gave me a name of their actual database. That's not the name of an application that actually applies rules and classifies sentiment. So the thing is, most employees, even database vendors, don't quite understand big data and their different offerings in this space because it's so new. But we'll continue to share our education in this space and keep you up to date so that you can be the most informed thought leaders in this space. And again, I would like to thank everyone uh, for participating and give this back to Karen. Oh, thank you, Janet. That was some uh, great information. Hopefully everybody learned uh, something new about big data. I think we all learned a lot and that our goals were certainly accomplished. If you're interested in having a, co a consulting session with Janet to discuss and brainstorm how your company can leverage social media data, please contact me at our company phone number. My extension is 232. In addition, for our next Big Data webinar, as well as other informational webinars on our website, you can download our white papers, follow us on LinkedIn, Twitter, and Facebook. Um, you can also su subscribe to our YouTube channel or simply give us a call. Thanks again for joining us today for this informational webinar. We hope you found the information helpful. Please send us comments on how you would like the web how you like the webinar and how we can improve upon it um, for future presentations. Uh, we'll follow up with the questions that were submitted and the related answers. And since we are out of time, we will make sure that those are sent to you via email. Thanks again. Uh, to all that have joined, and uh, we appreciate your participation, and, and have a great day.